This is a story about a city and its architecture. On the surface, overwhelming, hyperactive, relentless. In numbers, 7,840 towers, more than any city in the world, over a thousand taller than a hundred meters. Most are residential. It exceeds even Le Corbusier's imagination, whose vision of the ideal city is driven by efficiency. And yet, he says, My research is like my feeling directed towards what is the principal value in the life, the poetry. His plan combines core elements of traditional town life into towers and elevated walkways. Concrete is the dominant material. It's rough, unfinished surface giving rise to a brutalist aesthetic. One could say the absence of decoration is motivated by efficiency. But who can deny the poetry of revealing materials in their raw state? Hong Kong implements fragments of this manifesto to satisfy housing demand, adapting a plan conceived for the tabula rasa of post-war European cities to an existing urban fabric and mountainous landscape. In trying to connect the needs and desires of its inhabitants, Hong Kong reveals the dichotomy between efficiency and poetry in a different way. Where does this in-between quality come from? Even before Hong Kong is ceded to Britain in 1842, warehouses are being constructed along the waterfront by merchants in anticipation of a free port. The city grows as an intermediary between supply and demand. A hybrid culture takes root between East and West. Technology bridges old and new. A vocabulary forms that is both local and universal. In effect, the city is a middleman, whose characteristics become intertwined with the city's architecture. While the middleman does not produce physical objects, his characteristics impact Hong Kong in a very tangible way. Back then, they are called compradors, Chinese merchants who mediate between foreign trading houses and local suppliers. Bilingual, pragmatic, adaptable. They grow quickly as a community and symbolize the advantage of being in between two cultures. One of the most prominent compradors is Robert Ho Tong. He is born in 1862 to a Dutch father and Chinese mother. His father leaves at an early age, and his upbringing by his mother instills a firm Chinese identity. His bilingual education and skill set earns him a job at Jardine and Matheson. He marries the daughter of a Jardine's director, further cementing his status in the company and becomes head comparable. Like Corbusier with his suit and thick-rimmed glasses, Ho Tung too has a trademark costume, a traditional Chinese robe, shoes, and skull cap. His wealth goes towards property, transport, social clubs, hospitals, schools, and political movements. Naturally, the qualities of being an intermediary are infused into the infrastructure of the city. In 1906, Ho Tung moves with his family to the peak, the first Chinese to do so. He commissions architect Palmer and Turner, who are known for their big financial and commercial projects, and perhaps more significantly, for their constantly evolving aesthetics. The house is constructed in a Chinese Renaissance style. Writers, actors, and politicians are invited from around the world. The house becomes a microcosm of the city as melting pot. If one looks closely, the middleman's qualities can be seen throughout Hong Kong. Connectivity occurs consistently, indifferent to context, sometimes hidden, sometimes on display. Pragmatism guides development to a degree so extreme that it produces environments bordering on the surreal. Adaptability permits the constant adoption and discarding of ideologies. Symbolism reinforces the image of the tropical island even in the most urban setting. These qualities show not only the city's ability to survive, but the beauty of survival. <laughs>